With SummerSlam being this weekend, here in today's video I will be covering each match and giving my predictions as to who will win each contest. Hey what's going on wrestling fans, welcome back to the channel, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. And if you're new to the channel, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to keep up to date with all the pro wrestling content that is produced on this channel. And I gotta say, SummerSlam this year has the potential to be one of the better cards in recent memory. Surprisingly, there is nothing but one-on-one -on -one contest as of the uploading of this video. And we're gonna get a lot of culmination of storylines. Of course, we'll jump right into that in a moment. But I do think that this SummerSlam has a lot of potential to not only bridge the gap between what stories have been told in the last year or so, but also moving forward and how we can have a continuation of some of these storylines and these character arcs. Of course, with the first match that I will be discussing, it is the World Heavyweight Championship, Damian Priest defending his title against the King of the Ring, Gunther. This is a match that I think has a lot of interest and intrigue due to the way it's been built up the last couple of weeks. I know heading into the SummerSlam event, there were some individuals, some fans, who were a little bit concerned in regards to the level of hype and the anticipation when it came to this matchup. We knew there was a possibility with Seth Rollins returning at Money in the Bank that he could defeat Damian Priest for that World Heavyweight Championship and create a much more exciting match, you know, for lack of a better phrase, um, against Gunther. Some people didn't think that this match was going to be of caliber to a SummerSlam event. For more on that, you can check out the Jerry Podcast episode as well as the clip that I uploaded earlier this week. But Seth Rollins, and we'll, again, we'll get to him in a moment, definitely could have carried this matchup regardless of who it was. I like that the WWE took this opportunity to build up two stars. Everyone knows that Gunther for sure will be a future World Heavyweight Champion. We know because of the work we've seen in NXT UK, in regular NXT, and during his reign as the Intercontinental Champion, we know that Gunther will be something and already is something special. But the question became in regards to Damian Priest. His presentation as the holder of the money in the bank was questionable at times as some people believe that he didn't really he wasn't really presented as an intelligent uh, money in the bank winner as he had countless opportunities to cash in said contract ultimately waiting until WrestleMania 40 providing a great memory a great moment not only for WrestleMania but in for his career in general I think the story that they've been telling with Damian Priest really exceeds all expectations for me personally at least because you look at the, the story that they've been telling you go back to Backlash when he had his first title defense on a pay-per-view event or a PLE event depending on who you ask um, against Jey Uso and there was interference from the Judgment Day then you go to the Clash at the Castle event where there was interference by CM Punk and then the Money in the Bank event where we saw the interference by CM Punk again Andrew McIntyre essentially the story with Damien is he wants to get this done on his own. He wants to prove to everybody, to all his doubters, to all his critics, that he is legit. And it's shown a slow but progressive turn into a babyface. The Judgment Day, for the better part of two years, has been a heel group. But we're seeing instances where obviously Damien Priest and Rhea Ripley are kind of turning into babyfaces. Rhea Ripley, I think without a doubt, has been a baby face just because of the crowd reaction just because of the treatment that the WWE has presented her with um, but Damian Priest slowly turning into that baby face role I think when it comes to this matchup I think this was the right call I, in all fairness none of us are in the position that the WWE writers or the higher-ups are in and so nine times out of ten I will trust them especially in the current regime that the WWE creative is in Drew McIntyre, excuse me, Damian Priest and Gunther has been able to elevate that level of interest with the added story point of Gunther, you know, kind of demeaning and and really putting down the uh, the quality of individual that Damian Priest is. We've seen in couple in these last couple weeks how he's demeaned him as street trash, claiming that he is pretending to be someone that he is not that Gunther is the rightful World Heavyweight Champion and that he should already be awarded this World Heavyweight title. But Damian Priest would have none of it. He's been a fighting champion in this in this program with Gunther, that is. So I'm looking forward to seeing how they present just the overall matchup, 
where it's going to fall on the card as well because this is a card that is heavy on storytelling. You look at a lot of these matches have heavy weight to the quality of their of their matchups. Um, but for the purpose of this video, of course, we are discussing the predictions. I do not see Gunther losing this matchup. He won the King of the Ring tournament. It is obvious they want to push him to the moon as one of the best heels and one of the big stars in WWE, certainly leading into WrestleMania 41. I do have Gunther winning this matchup. The only question is, will it be cleanly? Will there be some kind of interference from the Judgment Day? I know we haven't seen Kaiser in a minute, and they've kind of separated the two for a moment. You know, that little soft push for Kaiser. But I do have Gunther winning this matchup. I hope it'll be a decently long matchup. I think you give these guys about, you know, 15 to 17 minutes to give them, you know, ample, ample enough time to, to tell a compelling story that they've already done so on the on the outside of the ring. But nonetheless, I do have Gunther winning the World Heavyweight Championship and beginning a lengthy world title reign. I do not see this ending in three months. I could definitely see Gunther holding this championship until WrestleMania, maybe even past WrestleMania. But for the purpose of this video, I have Gunther going over Damian Priest. And sticking with the King of the Ring title, we move forward with the Queen of the Ring, Nia Jax, who had won the women's tournament a couple months ago, earning a WWE Women's Championship match opportunity against the champion Bayley at SummerSlam. Again, another matchup that has kind of picked up in recent weeks. We've seen the inclusion of Tiffany Stratton because she's affiliated with Nia Jax. I think that's just added for another layer of depth. And a little wrinkle in the story that is being told, we know it's a one-on-one -on -one contest between Bailey and Nia Jax, but with Tiffany Strand being Miss Money in the Bank, it adds another layer of uh, you know storytelling and, and something to watch out for, certainly in the conclusion and at the end of this match. I've been saying for months since Nia Jax won the Queen of the Ring tournament, I think she unseats Bailey as the Women's WWE Champion. Um, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm kind of flip-flopping here. There's a little part of me that thinks that Bailey could, you know, retain the championship just because of the presence of Tiffany Stratton. But I'm going to hold firm. I still believe that this is the time they're going to crown Nia Jax, who has had a better run with the company this time around than her original run. I think she's done a lot of great character work. Her in-ring quality has improved. I think a lot of times when it comes to champions, and it goes back to Gunther, um, when you have a heel champion, it provides a more entertaining and compelling storyline because you have your baby faces chasing, you know, the big bad of the story. I, there's another part of me who thinks, why would they have, you know, two heels winning? A lot of times they keep it balanced and they have a baby face and a heel. That wasn't the case with the King of the Ring and the Queen of the Ring. They had two heels. So a, a big part of me believes we will see both tournament winners winning the uh, their respective world champions. And I think it adds to the story of Tiffany Stratton as well. Could we see a possible babyface turn for either one of them? I don't know. That's way down the line. I like them both as their heel characters. But um, I do see Nia Jax, unfortunately for Bayley, um, winning the WWE Women's, Women's Championship. And keeping with the women's division, let's jump right back to Raw. For the Liv Morgan versus Rhea Ripley matchup again for the Women's World Championship. Another match that is heavy on storytelling. You can go back all the way to 2022 when these two were a tag team. Of course, then we had the injury bug that saw Liv Morgan miss some time. We saw uh, Judgment Day gaining the talent of a Rhea Ripley. And then seeing those two do battle in the summer of 2022, we saw that the injury that Liv Morgan sustained last year until she returned in 2024, the rivalry, it's a well-told story going on for years, but really the heart of the matter comes for WrestleMania 40 when Rhea Ripley had defeated Becky Lynch and had to you know, vacate and relinquish her Women's World Championship. And it comes to the point where Liv Morgan has professed her plan, the master plan, the Liv Morgan Revenge Tour. She wanted to get everything that Rhea Ripley had. The Women's World Championship, her her career essentially as she put her on the sideline, and then she targeted Dominic Mysterio and essentially the Judgment Day in itself. And there was a lot of speculation of will they, won't they, will they pull the trigger and allowing 
Dominic Mysterio to double down on a heel turn, betraying Mommy and, you know, aligning himself with Liv Morgan? Or will they go ahead with this matchup the way it's been presented with Liv Morgan versus uh, Rhea Ripley straight up for the Women's World Championship? We saw on this past week's Monday Night Raw, Liv Morgan is more focused than ever. She will not relinquish, relinquish this Women's World Championship. She has her sights set on Rhea Ripley, but at the same time, there's Dominic Mysterio. And that's an interesting point when it comes to this matchup. We talk about the the men's world championship and whether or not we will see an interference from the Judgment Day. But this matchup, I think, has more potential to include some sort of interference. Whether it's by Dominic Mysterio, Finn Balor, and JD, perhaps. Regardless, this match, I think, is going to be heavy, heavily featured with run-ins, with storytelling. I look forward to it. It's certainly a matchup that could open up the card and I think it's a great way to hook the audience but given the level of investment and time that they've put into this story and certainly this matchup I could see it being towards the middle of the card uh, with that being said because this match has been built up for months for years essentially I don't see them concluding it just so early I don't think we have Rhea Ripley win that championship I look at it in the sense that Rhea Ripley in any sense in any storyline and in any point of the year, can become world champion. Very much so to that of like a Charlotte Flair. You know they're main event caliber stars. You know they will constantly be at the top of the roster. So why do we want to take away the championship from a compelling character like Liv Morgan, who has been done, who has been doing some of her best work in recent memory? I think Liv Morgan retains the championship. I do not think it'll be a clean win. I do anticipate some sort of interference, some sort of shady finish, uh, Liv Morgan defeating Rhea Ripley and furthering this storyline, possibly past Bash of the Berlin and carrying into Bad Blood. I think the purpose of having the, bla the Bad Blood event uh, return as a major event was because of the stories being told. I think Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley certainly fit the bill when it comes to Bad Blood. So I have Liv Morgan defeating Rhea Ripley for that women's champion, retaining and continuing her revenge tour. And sticking with the Raw brand, the WWE Intercontinental Championship will be defended. SummerSlam is certainly seen to be a, a an event that is heavily featuring championship matches, which isn't a bad thing. We have Sami Zayn defending yet again his Intercontinental Championship against Braun Breaker. We saw these two meet up at the Money in the Bank event where Sami Zayn was able to sneak out a victory and defeat Braun Breaker, handing him his first main roster loss. Um, certainly a matchup that I didn't think was going to result in that way, and that's why I think that result, the original result that I had predicted, will occur here at SummerSlam. I do not see Braun Breaker losing back-to-back you know, PLE matches against Sami Zayn. I think Braun Breaker will win the Intercontinental Championship. I think Sami Zayn has done a great job as the Intercontinental Championship, regardless of what the fans want to say. I think he's a fighting champion. He's consistently provided um, quality matches, quality stories. He's one of those baby faces that you always want to support and get behind. But I do think given the level of momentum and, and the... And just the quickness that Braun Breaker has been able to ascend to the top of the mid-card, essentially. I think now you put the strap on him. I think finally Braun Breaker wins the Intercontinental Championship. He has a run with it, mowing down the majority of the roster. Much like a Gunther, who was the Intercontinental Champion for years. I don't think you know Braun Breaker will be a champion for years like that. But I think it gives him an opportunity to hone on his craft, develop his character, develop his, his equity, and allow him to continue to climb up the card and eventually get to the main event spot where he could compete for that World Heavyweight Championship. Um, I don't think it'll be as long as their, their Money in the Bank matchup. I think this will be a much more decisive victory for Braun Breaker. I think given the character that has been presented on WWE television, he is going to come out you know, with uh, the mission statement. He wants to destroy Sami Zayn. He wants to leave no doubt that he is the better man, that he's the stronger man. And we saw in the promo package leading into SummerSlam off of Monday Night Raw that he believes, he being Braun Breaker, that Sami Zayn is already preparing for a loss because his his eyes and his mind are on something else. His, his comedy act 
that he's been doing in recent you know events um lends a good opportunity for an out for Sami for Sami Zayn. I do think that with this loss, it gives Sami an opportunity to te- you know take a step back, kind of enjoy some time off. Of course, not like a month or two, but he might you know miss a couple episodes of Monday Night Raw because he's been the Intercontinental Champion, a fighting champion, hasn't really missed any time since becoming the champion. So it'll give him an opportunity to take a step back and then possibly revisit this matchup. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Braun Breaker, I do anticipate winning the Intercontinental Championship. And speaking of the mid card, let's stick with it. The WWE United States Champion Logan Paul finally defending the championship against LA Knight. It is the third title defense for Logan Paul, and you know since he's won the championship, really, which has been heavily criticized. And I know there's that thought of you can't lose the championship. If you don't defend it and how he's a heel, we're not meant to cheer that. But it comes to a point where I personally think it devalues the U.S. championship. I think LA Knight will win this championship just to jump the gun. I'm going to go ahead and give my prediction there. I think it is the right choice. I think it is a smart choice given the level of talent, given how over LA Knight has gotten over the the past couple years. You look at his NXT days, what he did with the Maxine Dupree and you know the model gimmick. Um, and then finally reverting back to the LA Knight gimmick. It's time to finally see LA Knight with championship gold. Um, this is one of the matchups I'm looking forward to just because of the caliber of talent of LA Knight and the Logan Paul. Logan Paul certainly has been impressive throughout the course of his you know young WWE career. And being that it's in Cleveland, Ohio, I think that adds another layer of story to it because as we know, Logan Paul is from Cleveland, but he now lives in Puerto Rico, giving him another level of heat. Um... But yeah, I do think LA Knight, rightfully so, wins the U.S. championship. Hopefully adds a little bit of steam to that title because we haven't really seen it in recent years. I mean, we saw LA Knight, excuse me, we saw Logan Paul win the championship. We know how that title reign has gone. Rey Mysterio had it for a short time. Um, There was your Austin Theory run, which wasn't really looked fondly upon. So maybe this is the opportunity where we can have a solid heel champion in Braun Breaker for the Intercontinental Championship and the megastar LA Knight as the United States Championship. Um, Let's rock with LA Knight winning the U.S. Champion, another new champion crowned at the SummerSlam event. And finally, we have the WWE Championship. This will be the last prediction for the championship side. And of course, I think everyone knows what's the last match I'll be predicting. But with the WWE title, we have Cody Rhodes yet again facing off against a member of the bloodline this time the so-called tribal chief of this new iteration of the bloodline solo sokoa a matchup that although doesn't have a lot of um anticipation when it comes to the in-ring work because solo sokoa hasn't really been given that opportunity quite frankly Um, this is an opportunity for him though to show his worth to demonstrate where he is at in terms of his career, and where he could be placed in terms of the card. Um, The Bloodline story obviously is a very well-told story that has been going on for the better part of four years. In fact, this SummerSlam would mark, what, four years to the day, or excuse me, to the month rather, that uh, Roman Reigns had returned and really began the saga of the Bloodline. I think a lot of people's attention is more focused at the end of the matchup, which rightfully so. You look at Cody Rhodes, his reign as the WWE Champion. Some people are for it. Some people are against it. I'm one of those that is a fan. I think when you look at the match quality, you look at Cody Rhodes' matches against AJ Styles, his matchup against Logan Paul, some of the better matches of the year, especially when it comes to main events and a pay-per-view or PLE event. Um, The only concern I have is how is Cody Rhodes going to finish this matchup? My prediction is Cody Rhodes, you know, successfully retains his title. I think he defeats Solo Sokoa, but will it be through the help of others? I think given that in this story, there is no Kevin Owens, there is no Randy Orton. It's Cody going solo against Solo. I think he needs to win out of desperation. I think he needs to barely win. You need to see this become a real fight for Cody Rhodes and for Solo because you want to be able to protect Solo as well. You don't want Cody to go ahead and Super Cena defeat Solo Sokoa. It needs to be a brawl. It needs to be a war of attrition between Cody Rhodes 
and Solo Sokoa. I need these two to be spent at the end of their matchup. I think Cody, like I said, because of the experience, because of the level of, of trial and error that he has had to face in his career, he finds a way to eke it out, turning it into another gear, defeating Solo Sokoa. Again, not by like a blowout victory, but by barely securing the victory, basically outsmarting Solo Sokoa and really demonstrating that 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 flaw in pride by Solo. He so badly wants to be the the tribal chief. He so badly wants to be the leader of the bloodline. Maybe that gets the better of him and Cody, you know, takes advantage of it, exploits it and defeats Solo. And finally, at the end, Solo Sokoa after being defeated by Cody Rhodes loses it. He's just destroying parts of the rings. He's, he wants to go after Cody. And out of nowhere, we hear the words of Paul Heyman. And with Paul Heyman, he's not alone. That's finally where we see the return of Roman Reigns. And going going face to face with Solo Sokoa for the first time since WrestleMania 40. And I don't think we cash in on a baby face turn just yet. I think with Roman Reigns, we start sensing that, that division between the two. They both are fighting for the same team. But Roman is almost like big brothering Solo Sokoa. I was gone and you were trying to hold it down. But now that Roman's back, all the attention goes back to Roman. And for him, it's no big deal. It's business as usual. But for Solo Sokoa, it's that sense of envy. It's that sense of pride. I was holding it down because you weren't here. And now you're going to waltz your way back here and think it's all fine, think you're the man. The story really lies with Solo. Everyone's saying that Roman comes back to save the day. Roman eventually will save the day because of the interaction with Paul Heyman. I think that's one thing. But I think what really is the story here is Solo Sokoa and how he reacts to having Roman Reigns come back and steal the spotlight. But that will be the main event of the SummerSlam event. But for me, it's not the main match that I want to see. Of course, I'm referring to CM Punk's first match, first singles match, really, on live television against Drew McIntyre with the special guest referee, Seth Rollins. This is a match that I think everybody saw coming, given where it was going to be. We knew this was a SummerSlam-worthy matchup. A lot of people, myself included, considered it to be the main event. And although it won't be closing the show, CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre, the story that they have crafted over time, what really came naturally since the return at Survivor Series, and then what happened at the Royal Rumble, and then WrestleMania. It is a tale that has been told over the course of these last eight months continuously by all wrestling fans, all wrestling purists, and as myself through the Jaria podcast and this channel as well. But the interesting added point is Seth Rollins who has made it clear he is not a fan of either individual he laid down the law he revealed the rules and regulations on Raw this past week and basically hinted at it being no disqualification he left it up to the phrase of it'll be the referee's discretion uh, that tells me that this will be a brawl and I think that's what it has to be CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre have cost one you know cost each other major points in their career, whether it is CM Punk's injury, whether it is the opportunities at a world title for Drew McIntyre. This has become deeply personal, to the point where Drew McIntyre now is in possession of one of the bracelets that CM Punk would wear that was a gift from his wife, AJ Lee, that has her name and Larry, his dog's name, in it as well. So it is very personal for both individuals. Given what CM Punk has put Drew McIntyre through these last, what, five months? And because of where we're going next in this story, the real story was always Rollins versus Punk. And I think we're going to be seeing, you know, a, a little throwback to SummerSlam 97, where Shawn Michaels was the guest referee for the Bret Hart Undertaker matchup. And Shawn Michaels, his pride, his competitive nature, and quite frankly, his hatred for Bret Hart got the better of him. He swung the chair, meant to hit Bret Hart. And it hit The Undertaker. And he gave Bret Hart the victory. I think we will be seeing something similar to that. I think the feud between Rollins and Punk, that's where we're going next. Whether it is for Survivor Series, 
whether it's for WrestleMania 41, that is the next point in CM Punk and Seth Rollins' career. They're on a collision course for one another. I think his distaste for CM Punk will lead CM Punk to, will lead Seth Rollins to eventually costing CM Punk this matchup. I think Drew wins not only because of Seth Rollins' hatred for, for CM Punk, but also because Drew McIntyre was cost the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 40. He was cost the Fatal 4-Way number one contenders match the night after. He was cost his matchup at Clash at the Castle. He was cost his Money in the Bank contract when he cashed it in. At some point, we have to give Drew McIntyre something. And I think this is it. I think we give him the victory over CM Punk. Now, I don't think it'll be a one-off. As I mentioned with Liv Morgan and Rhea Ripley, I could certainly see them revisiting this feud for the Bad Blood event. The name itself, it, in, it leads people to believe that there are going to be heated rivalries at that pay-per-view. And quite frankly, maybe even a Hell in a Cell match. It could go to either feud, in my opinion. But I think Drew McIntyre gains the victory at SummerSlam and hopefully concluding a chapter of his career. We've seen this bitter Drew McIntyre. Hopefully with a victory here, we go a little bit further and have a more vicious Drew McIntyre. I know he's been vicious these last few months, but now that he finally has a taste of vengeance against CM Punk, let's take it a step further and make it Hell in a Cell. But regardless, that is my predictions for the SummerSlam event. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys are looking forward to it as much as I am. Go ahead and sound off in the comments below. What are some of your predictions for the event? What match are you looking forward to? And who knows, maybe even like, share, subscribe, follow the channel. Keep supporting as we continue to grow the channel. I appreciate you guys. Thank you all very much. Of course, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. And I will see you all in the next one.